So this is the moment I'm going to start. Um, good evening. My name is Catherine Hellerstein, and I'm the director of the Jewish Studies Program and a, prof and a professor of Yiddish literature here at Penn. On behalf of the Jewish Studies Program and the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, directed by Professor Stephen Weitzman, I would like to welcome you this evening to a very special program that has come about through a partnership between the Jewish Studies Program and the Katz Center, along with the generous-hearted supporters. On behalf of both the Jewish Studies Program and the Katz Center, I would like to take a moment or two to acknowledge the people who have supported this program and made it possible. From the Jewish Studies side, tonight's lecture is being offered as the 22nd annual lecture by the Patricia Brown Silvers and David Silvers Visiting Scholar in Jewish Studies. The Silvers family established the Silvers Visiting Scholar Program in order to bring a distinguished scholar in Jewish studies to the Penn campus, specifically in order to interact with students, faculty, and the larger community. We use this program as a forum to bring to Penn academics and scholars whose work is of, of distinguished intellectual caliber and contemporary relevance and that has a significant impact upon current intellectual and social issues in the field of Jewish studies and the larger Jewish community. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Eric Kandel, fits the bill. The recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2000, he is especially distinguished. He brings to this forum on Jewish studies the perspective of a scientist whose work on brain science illuminates most profoundly our understanding of memory, cultural history, art, and literature. He is also the ideal speaker for the theme this year at the Katz Center, which is Nature Between Science and Religion, Jewish Culture and the Natural World. We are grateful to the Penn co-sponsors of tonight's lecture, the Center for Neuroscience and Society, Mind Core, which is the Mind Center for Outreach, Research, and Education, the Office of the Dean of Arts and Sciences, the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy, the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures, the Department of History of Art, the Department of History and Sociology of Science, and the Visual Studies Program. Most of all, though, Tonight's lecture was made possible by the generosity of two wonderful people, Gary and Kathy Fields Rayant. Among their many philanthropic efforts, Gary, who is an MD, is a member of the Katz Center Board of Overseers, and his support of Jewish studies research includes making possible an annual summer school for grad students in Jewish studies that the Katz Center holds in partnership with Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Beyond Gary's abiding commitment to Penn and to Jewish studies, he is also a longtime admirer of Dr. Kandel, and his support of tonight's program is meant as a tribute to Eric Kandel's groundbreaking work. We want to give Gary a chance to say a few words, and as he comes to the podium, we ask you to help us in expressing our gratitude. Please, I don't deserve that. W one small correction, I'm only a DDS, not a real doctor. <laughs> but but uh, I do have a master's in behavioral science, which is part of my interest in, in your work. Uh, that said, I am more than delighted that you're here to honor us. I've been an admirer, follower, if I might say even a gr Eric Kandel groupie for quite some time. <laughs> Um, ever since I first saw you interviewed, I think shortly after you received the Nobel, um, I think the interview was about 2001, Charlie Rose, I believe, of blessed memory. Um, <laughs> and, and I was uh, more than astonished, in fact, mesmerized by your recounting, aside from the fact that I believe you played basketball with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, <laughs> was part of that uh, recounting. <laughs> um, but I was um, really um, uh, amazed to learn of your stories of Vienna 
and how Vienna affected you, because it had affected me too. My father was a refugee from Vienna, and your stories were so familiar. And then, as chance would have it, we bumped into each other, or at least I bumped into you, in the lobby of a San Francisco hotel where Kathy and I were going to dinner one night. And I went rushing up to you, and I felt like, I feel like a little kid. Is this you, Dr. Kandel? Is it really you? And I just, we briefly discussed my recounting of, uh, of listening to the, your interview and, and your story and how moved I was by your biography. And you said to me, there's just been a film made of my life and I will send you a copy. You sent me the copy and indeed I sent you a book of yours that you assigned for me, The Age of Insight, which is wonderful. I think I must have made you a bestseller by now. I've given it to so many friends and relatives. Um, and it was uh, uh, quite remarkable. I then went home and uh, I played the DVD. And immediately after that, I played my father's DVD. And I was a schmutter, a rag on the floor after watching both of them because the emotions I carried were so intertwined. The feelings that came through of the video of you and my dad were just enormous. So, um, after that brief encounter, I asked you whether we could continue the conversation. And I'm more than delighted that we can continue the conversation in this venue. So, before I close, I must stay, thank Dr. Steve Weitzman of the Cat Center for indulging me, because uh, after I met you, I was on a quest to have you present at Penn. And I'm glad that we can honor you, a legend in your own lifetime here, for not only all the work you've done and been so profound in art and science, but for your humanity and all you have done to facilitate a rapprochement with Austria. So without further ado, to continue the conversation, I'm so thankful to you. I'm going to take another moment to say that the Jewish Studies Program and the CAT Center are proud to have this opportunity to participate in Penn's ongoing efforts to bring an interdisciplinary perspective to bear on brain science, as well as the larger dialogue that the university supports between the different schools and disciplines in the sciences and the humanities. So finally, though, I'm very happy to introduce our colleague who will then introduce the speaker. This is a lot of layers of introduction, but the meta text is part of the, pro part of the idea. So Dr. Martha J. Farah, the director of Penn Center for Neuroscience and Society, is a cognitive neuroscientist who works on problems of the, at the interface of neuroscience and society including the effects of chi childhood poverty on brain development and the many ways in which neuroscience is changing the ways that we think about ourselves as physical, mental, moral, and spiritual human beings. As director also of, the, of SCAN, or the Social, Cognitive, and Effective Neuroscience Graduate Certificate Program, she teaches and advises grad students and postdoctoral fellows. Thank you very much, Dr. Farah. Thank you. Well, I have to say, when Catherine and Steve asked me to introduce Eric Kandel, um, I was honored and I was very excited. Um, this is because, as, as Catherine says, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. My interest is in the relation between neuroscience and society. And so, like Gary, I'm a huge fan. But then I realized I had made a terrible mistake. Because what can you say to interview, uh, sorry, to introduce such a person? Um, the usual formula, telling the audience, you know, how wonderful and important the person's work is, seems kind of ludicrously obvious when the person in question has won the National Medal of Science, the Lasker Award, the Benjamin Franklin Medal, and of course, the Nobel Prize. Okay, so the other thing you can do in introductions is um, give biographical details about the person's career and their life. But 
for the kind of talk we came to hear tonight, that's also obviously um, a very redundant bad idea. <laughs> so let me just give you one uh, picture of how you can think about the role that Eric Kandel and his work has played in the evolution of human knowledge. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little grandiose, I'm gonna refer to Diderot, <laughs> bear with me. Um, if you think about the ways in which human knowledge is classified, whether you're talking about the names of university departments or library systems, the Dewey Decimal System, we have categories like life sciences, chemistry, physics, political science, uh, you know, anthropology, sociology, psychology, and we can perceive relations among these different fields. And where Diderot on the Enlightenment comes in is that um, Diderot wrote an encyclopedia of basically everything, and my French accent is so bad I won't try to tell you the name of it, but he set out to explain how all human knowledge can, at least in principle, be integrated into a seamless whole, an understanding of all phenomena in terms of processes in the natural world. Now, in practice, this has worked out in limited ways. For example, um, biologists can explain how the functions of living beings, of, of cells, uh, work in terms of chemistry, and chemists can explain, or you know, can can point to the physics that underlie the chemical processes. Similarly, if you go higher up to more abstract, complex systems like societies, you can, at least in principle, um, see how uh, societies arise from individual minds and their interactions. But there is, between these kind of high level, you know, multi-human uh, systems and, you know, quarks, um, th there's a gap that until recently was, was stubborn. We could not bridge it, we could not make it go away. And that was the gap between the psychology of individual humans and biology. And I, I think it's fair to say that more than any other human being, Eric Kandel has shown us how that gap can be bridged. Starting in the 1950s, he began working on um, phenomena of memory and learning uh, at the single cell level. And he showed how cells, uh, special cells called neurons with their fancy tricks of signaling each other can, um, can come to encode memories. So to me, I mean, my hair is standing up on my arms a little as I say this. I mean, this is a huge turning point in the history of human knowledge to, to really be able to point to well-confirmed mechanisms by which the human mind and all the higher level systems that arise from it connect to biology and all the more fundamental physical processes that give rise to it. So tonight we're gonna hear, I guess, a little bit about that very important science, um, as well as you know, yet, yet broader um, insights about the human mind and culture. And with that, I will uh, hand the microphone to Eric. I think I have my Uh, my gosh, Martha, this is not the first time I've been introduced. I've been introduced a number of times in my life. This is the nicest introduction I've ever received. I wish my mother were here. 
She would have believed every single word. <laughs> I'm delighted and honored to be here. Um, this is a very special occasion for me. And I was asked to speak about my life in Vienna, my life in New York, and also the science that I do. And I've tried to sort of incorporate those three themes into my talk. Uh, let me begin with my life in Vienna. Uh, these are my parents. This is my mother, Charlotte, my father, Hermann. Uh, my father, as you can tell, uh, is an extraordinarily distinguished and very handsome man. Um, my mother and I were at his deathbed when he died. And she turned to me and she said, look how beautiful he is, even in death. And he was really a wonderful person. And the two of them were really great to my brother and me. This is my mother, my father, and my brother. He um, was a remarkable guy. He was five years ahead of me in everything, and he was just a genius. And to follow his footsteps was very difficult, um, but he was extremely supportive of me. <laughs> this is me. Neither as bright nor as good looking as my brother, but listen, got to make a living somehow. <laughs> and here I am at less than a year old. And my father had a small toy store in Vienna, on Kutschkegasse, which is still there. And this is my mother and my brother. And this is my brother and me. I don't know how old I was. I was two years old. He must have been seven years old or something like that. Um, and this is me when I was about four years old. And this is when Hitler came into Austria, March 13th, 1938. I'll never forget that. The Viennese, who talked as if they detested him, came out in throngs. Heldenplatz was just filled with people saying, Heil Hitler, welcoming with enormous enthusiasm beating up the Jews as they went along. They made the Jews scrub the streets. There was going to be a plebiscite whether we should stay free independently or join with Germany. And that was written on the streets. And this is what the Jews were asked to erase, to scrub out. I came to the United States. And one thing you learn as a Jew in Vienna is how to run. And <laughs> I was on the Erasmus Hall track team. In fact, I'm embarrassed to tell you I was co-captain of the Erasmus Hall track team. Uh, my co other co-captain was Ronald Berman. Uh, and he and I were not only good friends, but we've remained friends through our lives. He's a much better runner than I am. We won the Penn Relays. This is Ronald Berman. This is myself. This is Mr. Bartell, who is our track coach. This is the same team, variant. I then went to Harvard. Um, and I must tell you an interesting story how I came to typical American story. Um, in my senior year at Erasmus Hall High School, which is wonderful, I went to the Yeshiva Flatbush as an elementary school because I lived initially when I came here with my grandparents and my grandfather, whom I was very fond of, I knew him in Vienna very well. Um, thought I didn't have enough of a Jewish education. So he said to me, if I tutor you in Hebrew over the summer, I think you will be accepted to the yeshiva flatbush. And I really wasn't terribly interested in going to the yeshiva flatbush. But I'd started in PS217, which is a conventional elementary school in Brooklyn, where I lived in Coney, near Coney, Coney Allen Avenue. And in retrospect, I realized that this was a neighborhood that had a significant number of Jewish people in it, and there must have been a significant number of Jewish kids in my class. But in America, you can't recognize Jews from non-Jews as easily as in Vienna. I don't know why this is so. Probably a lot of intermarriage and things like this. A lot of Jewish kids have you know, blue eyes and blonde hair. This is unheard of in Vienna. Uh, and so I was uncomfortable in that class, because even though I'm sure a number of them, in retrospect, were Jewish, to me, they looked exactly like the kinds of kids that were beating me up in Vienna. So my grandfather said, I'll tutor you in Hebrew over the summer. And my guess is you get a scholarship to the yeshiva flappish. And I took 
his advice on that. And I went to the yeshiva of Flappish and had four wonderful years there. The yeshiva didn't have a high school in those days that I went to Erasmus Hall High School. Erasmus Hall High School, my senior year, Mr. Campana, my history teacher, approached me and he said, where were you applying to college? I said, I'm going to Brooklyn College. That's where my brother is going to school. And he said, have you ever thought of Harvard? And I said, no. He said, why don't you apply to Harvard? So I went home and discussed this with my parents. My parents were very poor. And they said, look, we, we already put out $10 to apply to Brooklyn College. Lewis is going there. It's a wonderful school. So I said that to Mr. Campana. He gave me the $10 so I could apply to Harvard. And I got into Harvard and a scholarship. This is me at Harvard in my freshman year. Needless to say, it changed my life. This is also Harvard. And this is Ron Berman, who was the co-captain of the track team with me at Harvard. I'm sorry, at Erasmus. He was a much better runner than I. I dropped out after a while, and I stopped running. I devoted myself to two things at Harvard, books and girls. <laughs> and this is my wife, Denise, on our wedding day. I could not have been more fortunate than to marry her. She is French, and when I first called her up, she didn't want to have anything to do with me. I tried one thing after another, nothing worked. And I finally dropped it, I was from Vienna. And she figured if he's European, he can't be all bad. So she, <laughs> so she went out with me, and I was fortunate enough to convince her to marry me. This is the two of us on the honeymoon. This is me doing research. This is Alden Spencer, one of my close colleagues, with whom I opened up the study of the hippocampus, and he and I were long friends until he died of an early death from ALS. This is Jimmy Schwartz, a later colleague. So I've told you about my life. Let me tell you a little bit about my science. And I'm going to tell you about what I'm working on right now, memory in the aging brain. Not a moment too soon. <laughs> um, now, this was not. Um, a significant problem until recently, memory in the aging brain. Uh, why would you say that's so? Why has it become a concern in the last 20 or 30 years and not before that? You look so intelligent. What do you think that's so? I'm sorry? People didn't live long enough to get this. You're absolutely, I knew she would know the answer. Um, people didn't live long enough. You don't really begin to see these age-related memory losses until the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, one saw classical Alzheimer's disease, but in addition, one saw something that you know, looked somewhat different. It was a disorder of memory, but it looked somewhat more benign. Uh, and it was called benign senescent forgetfulness. And what became clear that even in the absence of Alzheimer's disease, one could have a disorder of memory, and a significant number of people had that as a function of age. Um, so the question arose, how different are these? Are they really fundamentally different? Or is uh, age-related memory loss an early stage of Alzheimer's disease? So Scott Small and a number of people have devoted themselves to it. And the first thing they asked is, are different anatomical regions involved? We knew that Alzheimer's disease uh, begins in the entorhinal cortex and spreads from there. And subsequently, Scott showed that aging begins in the dentate gyrus and does not spread. Um, to explore the anatomical distinctions further, he and I turned to molecular approaches. Um, um, how does osteocalcin come in here? Um, I think this is a mistake in the way I set the slides up. But anyway, um, one of the things that uh, is important in uh, a, the aging brain, age-related memory loss, um, is a hormone released from bone called osteocalcin. Uh, it had been known that it affects anxiety and depression and spatial learning and memory, but one didn't really know how it important it was in age-related memory loss. But if one looks at circulating osteocalcin as a function of age, and this is in experimental animals, one finds that osteocalcin decreases with age, and this sort of parallels how age-related memory loss develops. And in wild-type mice, one can show 
that there's a decline in memory performance. This is a young animal, an aged animal. This is how they do in the memory test. But if you now give this aged animal osteocalcin, it performs as well as a young animal. Are there any molecular defects that are specific to the human dentate gyrus and not to the entorhinal cortex that is specific to the area involved in age-related memory loss and not specific to Alzheimer's disease? So we used affirmetric chips where you could look at a lot of genes, and we found that the number of genes were altered in a very specific way in age-related memory loss and not in Alzheimer's disease. But one that particularly popped out was RBAB48. This is aging brain, turns out that this involves critically an area called the dentate gyrus. And the entorhinal cortex, which is involved in Alzheimer's disease, shows no change in RBAB48. But there's a significant decline, both in the messenger RNA and the protein level, of RBAB48 in the dentate gyrus. So it turns out, and other studies have shown this, that aging affects selectively the dentate gyrus. Alzheimer's disease begins in the entorhinal cortex, but then it spreads. What is RBAB48? It's part of the switch that converts short-term to long-term memory. So activity activates the cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase, which phosphorylates a transcription factor called CREB, cyclic AMP response element binding protein. That recruits the cyclic AMP binding protein, and that recruits RBAB48, which initiates gene transcription. Humans allow correlations in order to look at causality, it's helpful to look at mice or other kinds of experimental animals. And, and we asked, is the level of RBAB48 selectively decreased in the dentate gyrus of mice? And we looked at the dentate gyrus, young mouse, old mouse, see RBAB48 is decreased. If you look at other areas, it is not altered. Moreover, you can experimentally play with this. You can look at a spatial task show a mouse two identical objects that spend an equal amount of time there because they see that they're familiar, they go from one to the other. But if you give, if you substitute one of these identical objects with a novel object, the animal is curious, will spend more time with a novel object than with a familiar one. Uh, so if you look at a young animal, it spends a significant amount more time with the novel object. <coughs> An old animal that doesn't have good memory doesn't do that. You can now take a young animal, inhibit RBAB48, and acts like an old animal. Take an old animal and increase RBAB48, it acts like a young animal. So this is really a key molecule in the cascade that's involved in the transition from normal memory to age-related memory loss. Uh, in people, it's been shown that dente gyrus function is disordered. If you image the human brain, you can see in this order in the dentate gyrus. Does this also occur if you inhibit RBAB48 in the mouse? And the answer is yes, it does. This is the dentate gyrus of the mouse, and this is with RBAB48 inhibited. And this is just the, the quantitative data. Dentate gyrus, RBAB48 inhibited, decreased circulation there. The rest of the hippocampus is normal. So to summarize, the clearest evidence so far that age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's disease are distinct uh, diseases are the following. The age of onset, age-related memory loss begins earlier, begins in midlife. Alzheimer's disease begins later. Anatomical localization, age-related memory loss, dentate gyrus. Alzheimer's disease begins in the entorhinal cortex and then spreads. Molecular defects. In humans, there's a linear decrease in RBAB48, both messenger RNA and protein. Old mice have a decrease in RBAB48. Young mice that have a reduction in RBAB48 that is artificially produced show memory deficits. This is in contrast to Alzheimer's disease, which is prominent not in the dentate gyrus, but in the entorhinal cortex. There's no abnormality in RBAB48. There's an A-beta toxicity. Does the aging body act on the aging brain? Are there hormonal factors that contribute to hippocampal dysfunction observed with cognitive aging? Might exercise help overcome these blood-borne insufficiencies? So there's a surprise that Gerard Kosenke came up with. He showed that bone, new bone, is an endocrine gland. It releases a hormone 
called osteocalcin. And osteocalcin acts on the pancreas, on the testes, on muscle, on the liver, and on various other glands, as well as on the brain. And direct administration of osteocalcin into the dentate gyrus, which is involved in age related memory loss, enhances contextual fear conditioning in both young and old animals. So it's a young animal, if you inject osteocalcin, you enhance its memory, and old animal also. This is only in the dentate gyrus. CA3 is not involved in this memory. Osteocalcin mediates its action via RBAB48. So osteocalcin can it immediate memory loss when RBAB8 function is inhibited in the dentate gyrus? So if you normally have an inhibition of RBAB48, you give osteocalcin. If, if, uh, you can't elevate RB48 at all. It's as, essentially, if you give vehicle, it has no effect whatsoever. <coughs> Behavioral effects of osteocalcin vary as a function of age. So this is a young animal. This is an old animal looking at a novel object recognition task. It's a young control and a young animal that you've given osteocalcin to. Aged animal also, if you give them osteocalcin, you see an enhancement. So osteocalcin enhances memory in both aged animals that have a memory defect as well as young animals. They also show a further enhancement of it. Osteocalcin injected directly into the dentate gyrus increases the level of PKA, of phosphocred, and RBAB48, all components of the switch that convert short-term to long-term memory. By contrast, osteocalcin knockout mouse have a low amount of phosphocred and RBAB48. So phosphocred is reduced in the knockout, and RBAB48 is reduced in the knockout. Osteocalcin low. Systemic osteocalcin passes through the blood-brain barrier and accumulates in the dentate gyrus, and there it's recognized by an antibody that reacts with both endogenous and recombinant osteocalcin. Here's the dentate gyrus, control osteocalcin. With mass spec, we've been able to identify a specific rece receptor, GPR-158, a seven transmembrane spanning receptor, that looks like a promising candidate to be the receptor for osteocalcin. This receptor recognizes and binds osteocalcin. Knockout of this osteocalcin receptor leads to reduction in the level of the RB, uh, AB48 protein. Knockdown of the osteocalcin receptor causes a memory deficit that cannot be rescued by osteocalcin. So clearly, if you don't have the receptor there, osteocalcin can't work. And you see this a novel object recognition task <clears throat> You can, even if you now inject osteocalcin into the animal in which the receptor has been knocked out, the osteocalcin can't have any action because it acts through the receptor and the receptor is not there. Osteocalcin increases twofold during exercise and showing you that walking is extremely good for you. And this is really quite important. This is aged mice inject with osteocalcin, busy as hell, saline, not at all. And this has really changed my whole philosophy of aging. I used to th think that any exercise is equivalent to any others. And I like to swim. I swim most days, and I thought this, this would do it. But it won't. It's very good. It's very good from a cardiovascular point of view. And it's obviously much more beneficial to have any exercise than to have no exercise. But in terms of the age-related effects, there's nothing like walking. Walking two miles a day is practically prerequisite people over 65 or 70, because it allows for the release, a significant release of osteocalcin. And osteocalcin seems to be a really important protective factor for age-related memory loss. So let me summarize. Osteocalcin released by bone ameliorates age-related memory loss through CREB1 and RBAB48. Because aging is associated with decreasing bone mass, this decrease in osteocalcin could contribute to age-related memory loss. Conversely, this might explain the beneficial effect on cognition in the age of vigorous exercise, which builds bone mass. The versatility of age-related memory loss strengthens the idea that age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's disease are distinct diseases. 
Age-related memory loss is not an early phase of Alzheimer's disease. It's a separate process. A sound body assures a sound mind. So let me summarize. Age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's disease are distinct diseases. Age-related memory loss begins earlier. There's a linear progression. Alzheimer's disease begins later. Age-related memory loss begins and ends in the dentate gyrus. It doesn't propagate beyond that. Alzheimer's disease begins in the interval cortex, but propagates from there. The molecular defect, decreasing RBAB48 and cyclic AMP signaling, is the molecular defect in age-related memory loss. There's no or minor loss of nerve cells. In Alzheimer's disease, there's a classical A-beta toxicity, a protein folding disorder. There's a major loss of nerve cells. So what is the treatment for age-related memory loss? To prevent the onset or progression of disease, one, regular physical exercise to increase osteocalcin, and particularly walking. Good diet, low in animal fats, control of high blood pressure and diabetes, cognitive challenges like new tasks, and social involvement. So the key is continue to work and to learn as physicians, scientists, and to enjoy your lives. Thank you very much. I would be glad to answer any and all questions. I would be glad to try to answer any and all questions that you may have. So please begin. Madam. I have a microphone. One thinks at the moment. Because of the age, early age, yeah. One thinks at the moment that this is a uh, particularly um, genetically determined form of Alzheimer's disease. There is a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, which you can see trace in families. That always begins earlier than the conventional Alzheimer's disease. So it's likely to be that form of Alzheimer's disease. <coughs> but by chance, even non-genetic forms will occasionally occur early. Madam. So you're talking about walking, yeah. and uh, they talk about um, different types of walking, whether you should just do slow or whether you should mix it up. You, you kind of fast walk and then slow walk, or, you know, uh, do you have, can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by walking two miles, how we should do it, I and heart rate? you know, get it up to a certain level with fast walking or whatever you think. Most of those studies are not definitive at this point. I think the only thing one knows is that walking two miles a day is extremely beneficial for you. Now, obviously, walking a little bit faster is a good thing for you in general, but I think the key thing is to walk. Have they taken the osteocalcin and used it in humans to see Beautiful. if there are any results? Beautiful. Obviously, pe people are trying to get a form that you can give to people very readily, and that's being worked on. Yes, but that absolutely is something very worthwhile trying. It's a very, very interesting story. Um, so uh, let me recall to you what happened in Vienna in March of 1938. Um, Hitler was putting a lot of pressure on Schuschnigg, the Chancellor of Austria, telling him that number one, the Nazi party should be allowed to be a legal party. It had been outlawed in Austria. So Schuschnigg conceded and allowed the Nazi party to exist. Hitler then put further pressure on him uh, that he should include two Nazis in the cabinet. So Schuschnigg agreed to that, and he put two Nazis in a cabinet. And Hitler bombarded him again and made further requests. And Schuschnigg said, Dayenu, I'm not going to go one step further. He said, we're going to have a plebiscite in Austria. We're going to vote. The public is going to vote. Should we stay as an independent nation, or should we join Germany in a unified German-speaking nation? And that was set for March 13th, 1938. And everything was set for that plebiscite to occur. And Hitler saw that he was going to lose the plebiscite, and he marched into Austria. 
and there was no opposition to him at all, that whole population that appeared one day before that, very likely to vote against him. All the newspapers said, it looks almost certain that Shukshik is going to win. All those newspapers said, isn't it wonderful? All the German-speaking nations have been united. This is a hypocrisy for which the Austrians are particularly strong. Um, and Hitler marched, marched in and was received with enormous enthusiasm by the Viennese. I was there at the time. I, my brother had built a uh, uh, sort of a radio set in which you could hear things. And the, the enthusiasm that they had, Heldenplatz, 200,000 people stay there when Hitler arrived in Vienna. It was just absolutely amazing. How did your parents get out after that point? Yes, that was your question. <laughs> um, that plebiscite that was about to occur, which he undercut by marching into Austria, my mother was afraid that despite all the newspapers saying, you know, Schuschnigg is going to win, my mother was afraid it might go the other way. So she had a brother in the United States, my uncle Berman, and she contacted him. The, she went to the embassy. The embassy told her, you need an affidavit from somebody in the United States who has the resources to support you. She had a brother who could do that. So she wrote to my uncle Berman, and he pro provided all the affidavits we needed in order to get out, and he made it possible for us to come here. Wow. Yeah. So I came on the SS Geraldstein with my brother. Uh, we left a year after Hitler came in. So we left about April 39. Yeah. My parents didn't leave until uh, August 39, just before the war broke out. Yeah. But it's really interesting how you handle different situations in different contexts. Uh, I was nine at that time. My brother was 14. My mother and father went with us to the train station on a train that took us to Brussels. And from Brussels, we went to Antwerp to take a boat that would take us to the United States. Now, here we were, 9 and 14, and my parents let us go by ourselves to, you know, God knows where. And it, my mother had the complete confidence that everything would work out. I don't know whether this is something she had forced on herself or she genuinely believed. You know, she was probably a more religious Jew than I was, and maybe she believed it. Oh, yes, we came months before they came. And uh, this is another thing. My parents uh, had tried even earlier to get us out. There was a kinder transport to England. We were on that transport. It was canceled at the last moment, so we didn't go. Yeah, yeah. We came four or five months before our parents did. Yeah. Yes? Did your brother become a scientist also? No, my brother did not. Uh, my brother was a German scholar. Middle High German, really an extraordinary guy, but he did not, uh, he could have done it. He was very, very bright, but he didn't become a scientist. He was very pleased when I went to medical school. But you know, this is no longer true, but in the Jewish profession, a son of doctor made up for all the sins in the world. <laughs> <laughs> there are several hands up there. Um, at some point, as an adult, you returned to Vienna? Oh, I've returned several times to Vienna. Can you talk a little bit about your, for your initial encounters? Um, it's very difficult for me to talk about that. Um, so, um, how can I put it? Um, when I won the Nobel Prize, um, the phone rang off the hook. Um, a lot of the calls were from Vienna. Isn't it wonderful to have a Nobel Prize, a Viennese Nobel Prize? And I said, I think you've got this wrong. This is an American Nobel Prize, an American Jewish Nobel Prize. That's what it comes. <laughs> so the president of Austria, Heinz Fischer, writes me a letter saying, how can we honor you? I said, I don't need any honors. I've got more honors than I deserve. I would like to have a symposium at the University of Vienna on the response of Austria to National Socialism. Wow. 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 This is published. Uh, they allowed me to invite whomever I wanted. I asked Fritz Stern, who's a major German historian, to help me. And we compared 
the response of Austria to other countries in Europe. Uh, and it was really extremely instructive, not only for us, but for the University of Vienna, people who went to the, um, to the symposium and to the book that ultimately came out, which I think was quite influential. Um, so since then, I've had some continued contact with, uh, with Austria. My wife and I are going there in a week or so because uh, they're putting a special plaque on the apartment house that my parents and I lived in. Oh. Why all of them? Dayenu, I mean, I'm pleased they're doing it. But why after you know, more than 50 years they've woken up to the fact that maybe they should you know, recognize this in some ways? I'm interested in your experience at Harvard. It had quotas for Jews. What was your experience in terms of anti-Semitism when you were there? I had zero uh, uh, feeling for anti-Semitism there. And this may be part of my own character structure. Um, there are certain contexts in which I'm quite sure I might have elicited some anti-Semitic sentiment. But I really only had two interests at Harvard books and girls, in order to really have exposure um, to anti-Semitic response, one needed to join sort of special groups which were not necessarily fond of Jews unless they met certain criteria. And one major group was the various clubs that existed, the Hasty Pudding, blah, 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 blah. I had no interest in those clubs. Books and girls were the only thing I was interested in. And, uh, you know, uh, but people who wanted to join clubs, particularly some of the more elite clubs, did have difficulty if they were Jews, unless they were great athletes or they did something else. It wasn't the Jews who were completely excluded, but the criteria for them was completely different than from anybody else. Sir. to the right again. <laughs> this, this mass amnesia is a complete lie. They know damn well what happened. They just pretend nothing happened. They were terrible. People describe that the anti-Semitic outbursts uh, when Hitler came into Austria were much more vicious than anything that happened in Germany. And in Kristallnacht, the viciousness, and we were there, we experienced it, that the Austrians showed toward the Jews was much worse than was happening in Germany. There is more anti-Semitism in Austria, and probably even now. Than Germany is almost impeccable now, the way it's dealt with its past. Austria, for the longest time, we were victims. We did nothing. I was there. They were not victims in the slightest. They welcomed Hitler enthusiastically. Yeah. I'm sorry. They, they, She's coming to you, so. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I wanted to ask a bit about the science. Um, sure. You uh, mentioned earlier that with the osteocalcin, you um, had previously believed that like any type of exercise would be beneficial for health and for aging, but um, these findings had lead you to, to not believe that about swimming. And I wanted to ask, um, is most of that based on evidence from mice? Yes. As I might think that. Like yes. with mice, swimming might not be a leisurely exercise. No, 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 like, no, 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 no. It might be no, traumatic. No, 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 no. You know? No, the osteocalcin release with exercise comes importantly for mice. The swimming has nothing to do with it. I swim most days, and I thought that was sufficient. I now feel very important that when you get to be my age, walking is extremely important. You can all do all the swimming you want. It's very good from a cardiovascular point of view. But in terms of getting the benefits that osteocalcin gives you, walking is significantly better. Could that, at all, could, could that at all be driven by the fact that there might be stress hormone release or other things during swimming in mice because it's a, it's a life-threatening situation, whereas like running on a wheel is leisure? I, right? I, I don't think this no. is the issue. I really think that there's something different to walking than to swimming. Yeah. I'm not saying that swimming is bad. I'm just saying that if you want osteocalcin release, which we know is important, walking is what you've got to do. Yeah. 
Uh, my question just looks more at um, how did you get involved in, or how did you even think to start studying the brain and um, like researching memory? How did I get involved in the brain and the memory? Okay, so I went to Harvard. <laughs> um, I went to Harvard and I majored in uh, history and literature and I wanted to understand what happened in Europe in 1938-39. You know, how could intelligent, interesting people all of a sudden become so vicious? And I wrote my honest dissertation on response to National Socialism of three German writers, Zuckmeier, Kauss, and Jünger, who had three different positions on the political spectrum. One was an anti-Nazi, one was a pro-Nazi, and one was in between. And um, while I was a junior at Harvard, I fell in love with a wonderful woman whom we ended up not marrying, but I, we had a very nice relationship, uh, who influenced me a great deal. She was the daughter of a very famous psychoanalyst. And he said to me, Eric, if you want to understand the human mind, if you understand what happened to you and to other people, you're not going to do it through intellectual history. You've got to study the mind. You've got to do psychoanalysis. And he was a major psychoanalyst. So I began to read Freud, and Freud is you know, one of the most seductive people in the world. So I said, gee, this is really interesting. I had never thought of going to medical school. I thought medical school is a horror. But nonetheless, in very short notice, I took the pre-med courses. And I was accepted in medical school on the proviso that I take organic chemistry before I get into medical school. So I went to summer school between graduating from Harvard and starting NYU Medical School. So I had all my requirements complete. And I went with the idea of you know, becoming a psychoanalyst. And all my summers, I worked in psychiatric hospitals and blah, blah, blah. I, I underwent an analysis. And then in my senior year, I thought that even a psychoanalyst should know something about the brain. <laughs> Amazing insight. The most profound insight of my life. Uh, so um, I took an elective in brain science uh, with Harry Grunfest at Columbia. And I'd never worked in a lab before. And I said, this is fantastic. You work with your own hands. You set up experiments. You talk to other people. You get feedback. I've never had an experience like this. And by that time, I was dating Denise, the woman I would ultimately marry. And I said to her, you know, I could see doing this for the rest of my life. But uh, it's unrealistic. You don't have any money. And I don't have any money. We want to get married. I've got to go to private practice. And she said, money is of no significance. In the subsequent 61 years of our marriage, she's never repeated that. <laughs> so, so it depends on when something is said. It has to be in a context. Oh, over here? OK. Uh, um, I just had another science question for your knockout of RBP, RBAP48. Was it a whole body knockout or just a neuronal knockout? Neuronal knockout. OK, so if you knocked it out, would that have cell cycle effects like the mouse wouldn't? Right. Yeah. So your, your book that I mentioned before, The Age of Insight, yes. is you're not only very distinguished, but you're very intelligent. Could you talk about your interest in art and how you put that particular book together? Oh my gosh. Um, I've been interested in art much of my life, but particularly since we're married. Um, from the beginning, we started to collect art. And we have a, you know, considering we're academics, we have a very nice collection of um, primarily etchings, lithographs, an occasional drawing, and a very rare oil. Uh, so we just get enormous pleasure out of that. We go to museums very often. And then I got interested in reading about art and writing about it. That's how I got into it. Uh, 
Um, and I've actually done a book recently that isn't published yet. Um, and yes, I've enjoyed that a great deal because I think brain science gives you some interest in that. And let me put that into context. Um, Alois Riegel was a major art historian. I don't know those of you who know about art history, but he was in Vienna, major art historian. He was an influence in Gombrich and on Chris. Uh, and he said, um, art history is going to die unless it becomes more scientific. And the science that ought to relate itself to is psychology. And the problem it ought to concern itself with is how people respond to works of art, what he called the beholder share. And this is the most obvious thing in the world. I mean, the artist creates the work of art so that people look at it and respond to it. That's true, but no one had really studied it systematically. And that got people interested in that. And I became interested because people were beginning to approach it from a psychological point of view of trying to get some neurobiological insight into it. I'm also interested in particularly how do people respond to figurative art versus abstract art. And I'm studying this now actively, including doing imaging studies on people while they look at an abstract, transitional, and figurative piece by the same artist. There's a lady there who has a hand up. So I asked you about walking before. Now I'm going to ask you about running. <laughs> right. So can, there's, there's also a professor at uh, um, uh, Harvard who believes that you, uh, that people should jump and that improves uh, bone density. That may so, very well be so. So what do you think about running or, you know, oh, cross training? I think running is better than walking, probably, because it also gives you more cardiovascular exercise. But I'm speaking about an age group in which running is less likely on a statistical basis. <laughs> uh, I mean, I used to be, I was co-captain of the Erasmus Hall track team, but I'm not very good at running these days. Thank you very much uh, for this talk. And I want to stick with the bone density uh, question. Given that, um, if, as I've been told, uh, um, bone density declines more in women as they get older. Absolutely. Do you also see a greater uh, extent of memory loss in women as they get older than you do in men, which would be the prediction, I believe? There is, this is just being looked at now. There is some trend for that, yes. You're getting some workout, kid. <laughs> so, a, lot, a lot of osteocalcin there. <laughs> Walter the Good. Sir, So please. nearly uh, every department here at the University of Pennsylvania is glad to put their name on this lecture. And, um, and, and the lead... Uh, the is, lead is this mine or yours? No one knows I'm here, so it's not for me. <laughs> um, but the lead, the, the lead academic uh, centers that are, uh, th that are hosting us are the uh, Jewish Studies and the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies. You're cl clearly a Jewish man, and so it's appropriate that they are leading this effort. But is there something Jewish in the work that you've done or Jewish that's motivating um, that's motivating you? Um, look, I'm Jewish. <laughs> I try to hide it from you until this moment, but I'm Jewish. Uh, no. Um, I think Jews in general uh, tend to have sort of intellectual tendencies. And the kind of thing I've done, many people have done. Uh, so I think it's more common to have you know, Jewish people do academic work of this kind uh, than other religions, perhaps. But uh, I don't see this as a direct connection to, uh, to Judaism. Yeah, yeah. What is amazing is um, how successful Jews are scholars. Do you know what percentage of Nobel Prizes have gone to Jews? Does anybody know? What did you say? 
60? No. Twenty-two percent. But that's amazing. Jews are point two percent of the world population, but they have you know slightly over twenty percent of all Nobel Prizes. It's amazing. In all scholarly activities, you find that Jews do disproportionately well. You know who's responsible for that? You know who's responsible for that? Their mother. <laughs> My son, the doctor. <laughs> Sir. How, how many uh, Jewish humanities escaped the Holocaust that won Nobel Prize? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the number of people, the number of Jews who have won Nobel Prize is amazing. I mean, it's disproportionate by far to uh, their, you know, incidence in the population as a whole. But, uh, and certainly it's a significant number of them. I mean, many, I know several people who've won Nobel Prizes who came from Europe uh, to the United States. Was it your interest in art that you put the lady in gold on the cover of your book? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I think that Martha explained, helped those of us who are not scientists understand how you've bridged psychology and hard science. Um, as somebody who teaches in the humanities, uh, a very uh, an arena of academia that is really very undervalued, increasingly undervalued today. I'm wondering if you see, perhaps through your lenses as a lover of art or any other aspect of your person, if you see other ways in which people who haven't really developed their scientific chops can interface and even uh, perhaps advance some of the work that is being done on memory and neuroscience? Uh, I think the best way to do this is through collaboration. Um, if you identify a theme that interests you in literature, for example, Proust and memory or something like that, to try to get together with a biologist who's interested in memory storage to see whether they can extract from the literary description some biological parallel that would be useful to do, and that would be, wouldn't be very hard. So I think a collaboration, and that, you know, there's no way, there's no way a single person can do all of those things, yeah. I wanted to ask an Osteo-Kalsen question. Um, uh, excuse me, let me just interrupt. Would you keep that, I, I come back to you. Uh, let me just tell you one thing that was very helpful for me. Um, I majored in history and literature at Harvard. That was just the best thing in the world for me. I learned how to write essays. I'm not scared to sit down and write things and rewrite them and rewrite them. And that has allowed me later on, when I've had a scientific career, to go into these side branches and to enjoy them. But if I had not majored in that, you know, if I'd majored in you know, some aspects of biology or physics or chemistry, I would, probably would not be doing this. Most of my friends don't write outside of science. Among my intimate friends who are scientifically, everybody's competent in me, they don't write books for the general public, which I enjoy doing. Yeah. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Fine. Um, is as osteocalcin um, associated with bone density so that yes, taking estrogen, which preserves bone density, does that increase osteocalcin? I don't know as a fact, but my guess is it does. But you can ask your gynecologist about that. Endocrinologist, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your beautiful talk. Um, um, your, your autobiography is called In Search of Memory. And um, the story that you tell of your own life and your scientific career is actually also a story of history and culture. And I see a strong connection between your work on the biology of, and physiology of memory in the brain and Jewish culture and Jewish history, because Zachor is a Absolutely. memory to remember is, is central to the narrative of 
uh, Jewish history and Jewish culture. And so I, I don't know exactly how to make the connection explicitly. That's maybe the topic for another conversation. But I do see that there are, that when I'm reading your autobiography and learning in the most eloquent, clear prose I could imagine about how the, the different parts of the neuron um, communicate with each other, um, I feel that there's a connection between that and the, uh, the communication over centuries and eons between individual Jews and larger Jewish communal and historical and cultural issues? Um, so. I'm very Jewish. Uh, and I've often said to myself and to occasional friends that um, I really regret on some level, uh, and I'll explain in a moment, uh, that I didn't go to Israel and came to the United States even though my life in the United States couldn't be more blessed. I would never have been able to do the science. I would never probably have enjoyed life as much as I've enjoyed here. But to participate in the building of a Jewish state must be something fantastic. And to pass up that opportunity is a great loss for me. And uh, so I you know, think that having a Jewish state would be a wonderful thing to participate in. And you know, I didn't do it. but. I am aware of the fact that there would have been an alternate way to go. Yeah. Hi. I wonder if you have studied uh, music at all, because I there's a video on YouTube that says music lights up all the parts of the brain more than anything else. Uh, and I'm most interested, and I'm asking this question because of uh, memory in music. It boggles my mind that a pianist can sit at a piano and play for two hours from total memory, and there's thousands and thousands of notes. And I sit there and I wonder, how can I do that? I play the piano, but I cannot memorize one measure. So I'm intrigued, and I wondered if you've studied music and the brain? I've not studied music in the brain. It would be a wonderful thing to study. Um, but I have seen people play without any notes for an hour or more at the piano. Um, and clearly, they do this, I presume, in part, because not only do they have their score in their mind, but their fingers learn almost automatically in, in the relationship of the fingers to the keyboard. It's a special skill. But these people that do it started early and have developed this as a very special skill. It's like you speak English. It is you no know, difficulty. You don't have to think about the grammar. It comes automatically to you. But if you were to start right now learning Esperanto, you'd have a great deal of difficulty. We have one, time for one more question, and then you're in. Oh, no, no. I can go so Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do you, what, what is the interaction with psychotherapy and the kinds of brain functions that you're talking about? Um, I think I've read that psychotherapists claim that there is a brain function change in people when they are successful or people change in their life, that there's a concomitant change in some kind of structures in the mind, in the brain. All right. Uh, I'm trained as a psychiatrist. And um, I trained at Harvard um, at the Mass Mental Health Center. Um, and the guru there was a guy by the name of Semrad. And he um, didn't really believe very much in brain research. Um, and yet, um, uh, when he died, I was asked to give the memorial address in his honor. So I thought that the best way to honor him is to address the issue that we've both been discussing. And I wrote a paper called Psychotherapy in the Single Synapse, which I pointed out it's inconceivable to me that psychotherapy works without producing alterations in the brain. Now, my work was the first work to show that learning produces changes in how neurons interact with each other. It alters synaptic strength. Certain kinds of learning lead to a weakening 
others lead to a strengthening. For example, if I were to do this, at first it would bother you and it would excite you and it would arouse you, but if I kept on doing it, you'd learn to ignore it. That's called habituation. So when you habituate, connections get weaker. If I arouse you, connections get stronger. So connections change in all ways in the brain. And th this is very important to realize that. Uh, and people are now studying this in a variety of learning processes. And this is probably happening to some degree in psychotherapy, that you strengthen certain connections and you alter others. And people have now shown that, for example, if you're depressed and you respond effectively to psychotherapy, as you do with antidepressants, you actually see anatomical changes in the brain. There's an abnormality to begin with. That abnormality changes as a result of that. So these are clearly all brain processes. Hi. Um, so for young people who are interested in neuroscience and kind of building a career in that, do you have one piece of advice for people pursuing that career of how to be a good scientist based on your life experience? I think brain science is fantastic, and it's a wonderful career to go into. Uh, the best advice I can give you is the best advice when we give you an education in general. Pick two things that are important. One, the area that really gives you pleasure, and a great lab that works in that area. So I think working with good people is nothing like that, having role models that, that help you. It's a fabulous future, particularly as you study more complicated problems. Hi. Um, the preventative measures that you mentioned for age-related memory loss. I'm like, sorry? So for the preventative measures you mentioned for age-related memory loss, yes. like walking, social involvement, are those completely irrelevant for Alzheimer's disease, or is there still some benefit to be had? Um, I think the benefit is modest. It's very hard to reverse Alzheimer's disease um, with any of these measures. Now, one possibility is, this is actually one of the reasons why um, biological treatment has not been effective. Um, by the time you recognize something as being Alzheimer's disease, you've lost a lot of nerve cells. Nerve cells don't come back. So that's why even though there are drugs out there that look like they work effectively, they don't work on Alzheimer's disease. And the general feeling is that that's because so many cells have died by the time you diagnose it that you can't do much for somebody. So you need some way of imaging or something like that to somehow get an earlier grasp on the diagnosis. Hi, uh, you mentioned the importance of the mother um, to your success. So I wonder what's your, like, the, the most value of your mother? Um, like teach you when you in your childhood. I'm sorry. The most value, the values your mother teach you when you in your. What your mother taught you when you were a child. Oh my God! My mother taught me so many things. Be a good boy. <laughs> Be a good Jewish boy. Um, I think um, parents convey to you moral code that is very important, um, sense of decency, respect for other people, things like that are terribly important, as important as any. I don't think I learned anything substantive from my mother. I mean, obviously, she taught me a little bit along the line, but I didn't learn English from her or anything like that. Um, but she certainly taught me moral standards that were very important, and how one develops relationships with people. I think I would say those are the two most important things. Yeah. She taught me a little bit about kashras, but that didn't stay very long. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much for your inspiring talk. Uh, I'm just thinking about the autobiographical memory like when people get older and uh, you know, we talk more things about our, the, the past. So it seems the 
autobiographical memory probably is more and more stronger. I'm just wondering if there is any connection between the you know, memory, the loss of memory in this process with that. That's interesting. I would have thought that that is less of a alteration in the persistence of certain memories uh, and the loss of others as it is narcissism. <laughs> Uh, people do become very much involved in themselves. And as they age, they want to make sure that it's not been a waste of time, that their, con <laughs> their contribution. So, you know, one has a little tendency to build that up a little bit. Yeah. I, I think, oh, did I turn it off? I don't know. I, I think that this is a perfect moment to pull things together and thank Dr. Eric Kendall. Thank you.